Uh, narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This is, um, we're doing chapter one when I get there. Letter from Wendell Phillips, Esquire. Let me make sure this is correct. Nope. We're not going to do the letter. N narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, Chapter 1. I was born in Tuckahoe, near, near Hillsborough, <laughs> and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far, the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs, and it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I'm going to try to be okay as I read this, but I'm already, it's already emotionally gripping. Just the fact that you have a people group that look at another people group as, um, as objects rather than humans. And that makes me very sad as a Christian, especially, and, um, as an African American. But anyway, let's continue. I apologize for I digressed. Okay. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, spring time, or fall time. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me even during childhood. The white children could tell their ages. I could not tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. I was not allowed to make my, my inquiries of my master concerning it. it. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of a slave improper and impertinent and evidence of a restless spirit. Mm, the devil is a liar. <laughs> the nearest estimate I can give makes me now between 27 and 28 years old. I come to this from hearing my master say sometime during 1835 I was about 17 years old. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of a darker complexion than either my grandmother or my grandfather. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parentage. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father. But of the correctness of, of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant because I knew her as my mother. I'm sorry, before I knew her as my mother. It was a common custom in the part of Maryland which, with which I ran away to part children from their mothers. Let me read that again. It was a custom, a common custom, in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age, frequently before the child has reached its 12th month, its mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off and the child is placed under the care of an old woman too old for field labor. For what, this, for what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it is to be hinder, it, unless it is to be hinder the, de the development of the child's affection toward its mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. <laughs> it is extremely sad to think that um, when you think about it, can you imagine your child being thrusted out of your life for the purpose of creating immediately in my mind what made me think of what I immediately think of when I thought about them separating a child from the first love, their mother, is the de desire to create a robotic, loveless child without having experienced love from anyone, would not know how to love from themselves to another. Um, but God, but God, 
we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. So I don't look at uh, the white man or I'm just saying it that way because it's blunt. The book is blunt. I'm being blunt. I don't look at man at all as the source of this evil. They're just a tool for the devil. And the devil has no concern for color at all. He hates the one he uses as much as the one he's using that person to go against. So it's all, it's all fair game to Satan. <laughs> it's just unfortunate that the one that the devil uses, they have no clue. They think they're winning because they're okay. They're doing the job that they believe is a God idea. Kind of like Paul when he crucified, when he killed Christians. But um, thank God Paul got that road, Damascus road experience. Because there are some people who just don't know. And they still think that racism is uh, beneficial and biblical. <laughs> ah, praise the Lord. Okay, let's keep going. I apologize. I'm going to try not to digress anymore. Okay. I never saw my mother to know her as much more than four or five times in four or five times in my life and each of these times was very short in duration and at night she was hired by mr stewart who lived about 12 miles from my home she made her journeys to see me in the night traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work she was a field hand and a whipping is the penalty of not being in the field at sunrise unless a slave has special permission from his, his or her master to the contrary, a permission which they seldom get, and one that gives to him that one that gives to him that gives it the proud name of being a kind master. <laughs> I do not recollect of any of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me in the night. She would lie down with me and get me to sleep. But long before I waked, she was gone. Very little communication ever took place between us. Death soon ended. What little we could have had, we could have while she lived. And with it, her hardship and suffering. She died when I was about seven years old. On one of my master's farms near Lee's Mill. I was not allowed to be present during her illness at her death or burial. She was gone long before I knew anything about it never having enjoyed to any considerable extent her soothing presence, her tender and watchful care. I received the tidings of her death with much the same emotions I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. <laughs> Hopefully I won't get too tear jerky reading this. Called thus suddenly away, she left me without the slightest intimidation of who my father was. The whisper that my master was my father may or may not be true, and true or false, it is, of but, it is of but little consequence to my purpose, whilst the fact remains. In all its glaring odious, odious, oh my goodness, odiousness, O-D-I-O-U-S-N-E-S-S, -E -S, odiousness, that slaveholders have ordained and by law established that the children of the slave woman shall in all cases follow the conditions of their mother, and this is done too, obli mm -mm, too obviously to administer to their own lusts and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable. For, for by this cunning arrangement, the slave owner, in cases not a few, sustains to his slaves the double relation of master and father. <laughs> In other words, the slave master uh, can do what he wills with any children that he bears, uh, uh, that is bared of the, most of the children that are born of slaves were probably born of slave masters because the slaves were not given the opportunity to uh, procreate with one another as husband and wife. So most of the babies born of slaves at the time were biracial because it was the slave masters that slept with the slaves and that's the only way these babies were born and the slave masters considered the babies property of their own for use as work horses for lack of a better word and if they were girls they could also be used 
for the pleasure of the slave masters. Ha, huh, interesting. I'm reminded of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Forgive me. Okay, I digress. I'm going to try not to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know of such cases, and it is worthy of remark that such slaves invariably suffer greater hardships and have more to contend with than others. They are, in the first place, a constant offense to their mistress. That's because the mistress, who is the Caucasian wife of the slave master knows that those babies that that woman slave had are at the, the uh, are because of her own husband. So she's got what would be considered stepchildren and uh, her children have half brothers and sisters that are biracial because of her husband. Mm. That is something I never, well actually I probably did consider it, but can you, cons Think of it. Think of it. You are white. Your husband is a slave master. You both are slave masters. Let's just be real. But you're not sleeping with the men who are slaves, are you? No, of course not, because that would be un abominable. But what is, what is both profitable and appropriate is that your husband is sleeping with the women who are slaves. And for the enjoyment, probably in many instances, at the sacrifice of their own spouses. In other words, there's more enjoyment for the slave master to sleep with the slave than to sleep with their own spouse. Mm. Okay. Just read the book. All right, let me read the book. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. My daughter's getting upset, so I'm going to just read the book. Forgive me, but this is making me think. Um, Don't think, just read. Avery? You will go upstairs and finish your work if you comment. Now you're getting a flavor of my homeschool environment. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ah, this hurts all the way around. Okay, da -da 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 -da. okay. I know of such cases, and it is worthy of remark that such slaves invariably suffer greater hardships and have more to contend with than others. They are, in the first place, a constant off offense to their mistress. She is ever disposed to find fault with them. They can seldom do anything to please her. She is never better pleased than when she sees them under the lash, especially when the suspects, when she suspects her husband of showing to his mulatto children favors, which mulatto is what they called biracial children at the time. Um... Uh, the mistress sees her husband showing to his mulatto children favors which he withholds from his black slaves. The master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of difference to the feelings of his white wife. And cruel as the deed may strike anyone to be, for a man to sell his own children to human fleshmongers, it is also the dictate of humanity for him to do so. For unless he does this, he must not only whip them himself, but must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother of but few shades darker complexion than him and ply the gory lash to his naked back. And if he, li and if he lisp one word of disapproval, it is set down to his parental par partiality and only makes a, batter worse, a bad matter worse, both for himself and the slave whom he would protect and defend. Now that, I didn't consider that. <laughs> All right, every year brings with it multitudes of this class of slaves. It was, it was doubtless in consequence of a knowledge of that fact that one great statesman, statesman of the South predicted the downfall of slavery by the inevitable laws of population. Whether this prophecy is ever fulfilled or not, it is nevertheless plain that a very different looking class of people are springing up at the South and are now held in slavery from those originally brought to this country from Africa. And if their increase will do no other good, it will do away the force of the argument that God cursed Ham and therefore American slavery is right. It will do away with that. If the lineal descendants of Ham 
are alone to be scripturally enslaved, it is certain that slavery at the South must soon become unscriptural, for thousands of usher, thousands are ushered into the world annually who, like myself, owe their existence to white fathers, and those fathers most frequently their own masters. <laughs> wow. So now you see why the shades of brown-skinned people who are in the category of African American are so many. Uh, when you came into the country as an African, your complexion was not quite here. It was much richer. But as the, as the uh, racists begin to mix, which I believe is a God idea, so I'm not talking about, um, I think biracial should be returned by cultural because we're all human beings, one race. You have your opinion, but that's mine. It's based on the word of God. Uh, but now, as you can see, most people in the country of America probably have multicultures that involved brown, yellows, and pinks in them. All you gotta do is look at their skin. And in many instances where you're fair complected, just look at the hair. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. I have some beautiful friends who have beautiful curly haired, extremely curly haired kids and they're, they're, they're of a Caucasian culture. And uh, it is amazing when you see that extreme curl pattern on a beautiful pink child, uh, just like seeing the extreme straight pattern or wave pattern on an extremely rich brown child. One, one race, multicultures. It's beautiful. All right, let's keep reading. I like this book. I hope you guys are enjoying it. <laughs> I have had two masters. My first master's name was Anthony. I do not remember his first name. He was generally called Captain Anthony, a title which I presume he acquired by sailing a craft on the Chesapeake Bay. He was not considered a rich slaveholder. He owned two or three farms and about 30 slaves. His farms and slaves were under the care of an overseer. The overseer's name was Plummer. P Mr. Plummer was a miserable drunkard, a profane swearer, and a savage monster. He always went armed with a cow skin and a heavy cudgel, C-U-D-G-E-L, cudgel. I have known him to cut and slash the women's heads so horribly that even Master would be enraged at his cruelty and would threaten to whip him if he did not mind himself. Master, however, was not a, not a humane slaveholder. He was not a humane slaveholder. It was required extraordinary barbiturate, bar, mm -mm, barbarity, barbarity, there it is. It required extraordinary barbarity on the part of an overseer to affect him. He was a cruel man, hardened by a long life of slaveholding. This is talking about Mr. Anthony. Um, he would, at times, seem to take great pleasure in whipping a slave. I've often been awakened at the dawn of day by the most hard, by the most heart-wrenching shrieks of an own aunt of mine, whom he used to tie up to a joist and whip upon her naked back till she was literally covered with blood. No words, no tears, no prayers from his gory victim seemed to move his heart from his, its bloody purpose. The louder she screamed, the harder he whipped, and where the blood ran faster, there he whipped longest. Ah! Oh. <laughs> he would whip her to make her scream and whip her to make her hush. And not until overcome by fatigue would he cease to bring the blood clotted cow skin. I remember the first time I ever witnessed this horrible exhibition. I was quite a child, but I well remember it. I know I never shall forget. I'll never forget it whilst I remember anything. It was the first of a long series of such outrages of which I was doomed to be a witness and a participant. It struck me with awful force. It was the blood-stained gate, the entrance to the hell of slavery, which with I was about to pass. I was a most, it was a most horrible spectacle. I wish I could commit to paper the feelings with which I beheld it. 
of this occurrence took place every, very soon after I went to live with my old master and until the following circumstances. Aunt Hester went out absent when my master desired her presence. He had ordered her not to go out evenings and warned her that she must never let him catch her in company with a young man who was paying attention to her belonging to Colonel Lloyd. Wonder why that is. He knew nothing. I won't go. The young man's name was Ned Roberts, safely left to conjecture. Generally, I'm sorry. The young man's name was Ned Roberts, safe, um, generally called Lloyd's Ned. The, uh, why Master was so careful of her may be, hmm, may be safely left to conjecture. She was a woman of noble form and of graceful proportions, having very few equals and fewer superiors in personal appearance among the colored or the white women of our neighborhood. In other words, Aunt Hester was probably the product, the child of a slave owner and a, and a slave. And she was obviously a beautiful woman, uh, both in the black community and the white community. She, she stood out amongst all the people. Aunt Hester had not only disobeyed his orders, that's who we're talking about, not only did she disobey his orders in going out, but she'd been found in company with Lloyd's Ned, <laughs> which circumstance I found from what he said whilst whipping her was the chief offense. He had been a man of pure morals himself, Ned that is. He might have been thought interesting, interested in protecting the innocence of my aunt, but those who knew him will not suspect him of any such virtue. Before he commenced whipping Aunt Hester, no, we're talking about the master, Anthony. Before he commenced whipping Aunt Hester, he took her into the kitchen and stripped her from neck to waist, from neck to waist, oh gosh, shoulders and back entirely naked. He then told her to cross her hands, calling her, at the same time, a D blank blank D, B blank blank H. I don't even know what that is. D blank 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 D. D dash D. What the, What is that? I don't know. Dead. Oh, shucks. B I T C H. He called her a dead bitch, very likely. Thank you, Lord, for bringing that to my remembrance. I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to, what it was supposed to have been. That's what I believe he called her, based on the text. After crossing her hands, he tied her with them. He tied them with a strong rope, and he led her to a stool under a large hook. He led her to a stool under a large hook in the joist, put in for the purpose. He made her get upon the stool and he tied her hands to the hook. She now stood fair for his infernal purpose. Her arms were stretched up at their full length so that she stood upon the ends of her toes. Then, let me just show y'all what he did. He had her arms folded like this. Her arms were folded like this as if they were trying to cover up her boobs, but her breast. And then he tied them probably between the wrist and the elbows. And the way that he tied them was so that the, the string that was here, when he hooked her up on the hook, she had to stand on her tippy toes and her face was probably stretched through her arms and her back was completely erect, probably stretched where her spine was erect as possible because she was up on her toes. She probably was swinging, dangling at some point of being hit with the whip because of having to not be, not have her feet planted flat on that stool. Oh, I just wanted to give you a visual. Okay, let me keep going. He then said to her, now you dead bitch, I'll learn you how to disobey my orders. And after rolling up his sleeves, he commenced her lay on the heavy cocks uh, he commenced to lay on the heavy cowskin and soon the warm red blood 
amidst heart-wrenching shrieks from her and horrid oaths from him came dripping to the floor. I was so terrified and horror-stricken at the sight that I hid myself in a closet and dared not venture out till long after the bloody transaction was over. I expected it would be my turn next. It was all new to me. I had never seen anything like it before. I had always lived with my grandmother on the outskirts of the plantation where she was put to raise the children of the younger women. I had therefore seen until now out of the way of the, I, 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 I'm sorry. I had therefore been until now out of the way of the bloody scenes that often occurred on the plantation. That is the end of chapter one of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Mm. I'm going to ask you all to please uh, just bear with me as I read this because it's, it pains me to read this. But I do, you know, as a black woman, black history is, I, we're familiar with it. And um, I teach my daughter who is behind the black cloth. <laughs> I teach your black history exceptional because I'm a homeschool mom and I know in public school where I was raised, you only get a little bit. I actually learned about Frederick Douglass, but I can tell you it had, this book was not a part of it. So the history that I, the, the whole story, I didn't get until I was a grown woman when I decided to seek for myself as a black woman who's made to know that she's black uh, because of the dark world and the devil. I decided to do my own research on my black history. Um, and as a Christian woman, I know the truth about God making no junk. And I, I, I am, um, as a black woman, I like to share that we are one race. We are multicultures. I believe that. Just from the reading of this book, it proves it. You can put a black boy in the hood and a white boy in the hood and they'll come out looking and talking exactly the same. So that's not racism, that's culture. Wherever an individual is raised and whatever worldview is taught to them will create, uh, well, it creates the worldview, their culture, and it causes, and that's the way they live. Um, I have also been one who's experienced racism, both by interculture and outside of my culture. Uh, with regard to either being too white, according to blacks, whoops, what am I doing? Or not really black, according to my white friends. I'm, I, I wasn't black. I was told, you, you're not black, you're really white. And I was told by black friends or people, black kids, uh, you think you're white. So we are one race people and so many different complexions that are only melanin deep, that are only skin deep, and it's all based on melanin. When I bleed and you bleed, we look alike. <laughs> I don't care who's looking, who's, no matter who's listening. When we bleed, it's the same, like the mute, like the song. So thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying this. And if you're not, then I apologize, but the truth still remains the truth. You be blessed. Shalom, shalom.